perfect. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today we have the pleasure to to have Dr. Jean Giacomelli uh, from University of Arizona. He's a professor in biosystems engineering at the Department of the, the, the Department of the University of Arizona. Um, He's a founding director of the famous Control Environment Agricultural Center uh, since 2000 uh, for 18 years, uh, which the center is worldwide uh, recognized uh, for the, the science, the interdisciplinary science, engineering, education, research, outreach. Um, Dr. Giacomelli, uh, Jean, going back to your memory lane, uh, was a vegetable farmer initially in New Jersey uh, outdoor first, um, and then went to Rutgers University where he received his uh, bachelor's degrees um, in horticultural science and biological ag engineering, then UC Davis uh, for his master's in ag engineering, and then back uh, to Rutgers University for PhD in horticultural engineering where he stayed and developed the first hort engineering program in the country. Um, Jean uh, experiences and research is, 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 is tremendous. So in summary, you know, he has been contributing to control environment agriculture in the planet Earth, and also he can, has contributed in the space, in moons, in the moon, in the Mars, to the NASA projects, not to mention his great service to the Society for Horticulture, both national and international, as well as the um, uh, Asabe. So, Jean, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. That was a very good introduction. I appreciate it. And um, it's really a great opportunity to, um, to be here today to, to speak to um, the people who will come to appreciate, I hope, um, because of where you're trying to go, where you are going with your Controlled Environment Act program and, and opportunities that follow. So I will, um, as suggested here, be speaking about nutrient delivery systems. Um, um, but first, a message from our old sponsor. Um, yes, I was the former director for 18 years of the Controlled Environment Ag Center. And I, I put this up because of the vision to develop CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture, to be sustainable agricultural option. And sustainable means many things to many people but certainly economically, environmentally, and, and socially sustainable is we have to work to that. And the new director, Dr. Murat Kachira is, is working very hard at that. And as I'd like to think, um, and like our deans like us to say, he's gonna bring it to a new level. And we're all looking forward to that. In, in the meantime, um, I'm not gonna go directly into nutrient delivery systems. Um, but I will be discussing applications of those systems by example. And, and I wanted to start with a little bit about how did we get here? Um, and um, I go back into the 1970s and I can speak that hydroponics became very valuable, very um, apl applicable because of the nutrient film technique and um, the um, ability to um, um, remove all substrate, all earth, and go in a water nutrient delivery system. And at the time, of course, um, the substrates of uh, peat vermiculite were very popular and, and vegetable crops were grown in this way many times and also uh, flowering crops. But the substrate rock wool, came to be in the late 70s and really took off in the 80s because it was it's very inert. Um, it could then uh, use top drip irrigation and it was much easier to work with. It does have a challenge of what to do uh, after the end of the, uh, the, the crop. But in the 80s, there was a lot of excitement and um, I, I threw up this about energy conservation. Um, um, energy screens, double layer glazing, uh, heating from below, substrate heating or root zone heating, and then finding alternative uh, heat sources like waste heat from power plants or from other industry. And the computerization, the microcomputer, I say elementary because basically it could just turn things on and off. At least in my mind, it was a big switch, maybe an unpredictable switch, so I still kept time clocks around um, in, in parallel duty. 
uh, lighting became interesting. High pressure sodium vapor lamps um, had become more um, available for, uh, particularly out of Holland, for large scale production of flowering and, and vegetable crops. And when you need more electric power, you go to alternative uh, procedures like cogeneration or what is now called combined heat and power, where you burn natural gas to produce heat to warm your greenhouse. But in the process, you're producing electric power and you can clean up the exhaust gases and get your CO2. In the process, the expansion of greenhouses, the amount of labor, educated labor that need to be developed increased and the ability to use that labor more efficiently. Mechanization, handling, and spatialization uh, improved during the 80s. And finally, <clears throat> plant breeding. It really should be first because plant breeding made a tremendous um, uh, increase in productivity, particularly in tomato and lettuce over the, those de decades. When we get to the 90s, we see the LEDs beginning to come into studies uh, advanced computer control with more intelligent decision-making, IPM for controlling insects and diseases, uh, and then the beginning of the mega greenhouses, at least in North America, with large greenhouse here in Arizona, in Texas, in Pennsylvania, um, in, the, in the Northeast, uh, 50 acres, 20 hectares, all under one roof. That was a big difference from the micro greenhouses that we started to see more interestingly in the 2000s, uh, also known as high tunnels, a 24 by 100 foot greenhouse. That was one of my first greenhouses I ever built and uh, it works very well. Um, LED lighting systems developed tremendously in the 2000s and continue to today and in their applications, but more so for computer control sensors the ability to monitor the environment and monitor the plant directly. Um, we'd like more, but we're getting better at it um, and be able to put that into making decisions about environmental control. And finally, um, the people's market I wrote here, there became a demand for locally grown, safe, quality, dependable food products and greenhouses could do that. With that demand came some slightly higher um, sale prices, which made it profitable, and the expansion in the 2000s became tremendous, particularly here in Arizona, um, reaching several hundred acres within that 10-year period. And finally, the database-based management for information on decision-making, collecting more data, evaluating it in real time, and utilizing that. For today, in the 10s, the data analytics for clear and, and direct management of the greenhouse and its controls and its uh, presentation of, of new crops and plantings to maintain that productivity. Um, also now came the money, uh, entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists, those who, who have been um, in the industry um, um, came out and are much more prevalent now. Um, and new terminologies, vertical farms, urban agriculture, indoor growing, um, a lot of overlap in those names, but meaning other things to many different people. I like to think of this as the unconstrained creativity time. Um, and someone told me just the other day, it's still the wild west for controlled environment agriculture, and that may be, um, which is good, it's exciting, which brings us into this decade, um, which will start at 2021, I think. Um, and I ask all the students, all the people online here, I thank you for coming together in this way so that we could have this discussion. But think about these past 50 years and the basics that have come to be and now can be put together so that um, we can go further and continue to develop these. Um, I'm threatening a quiz in the Q&A session, but I don't think so. I'm gonna go through five different examples in really short order. Um, two of them coming from when I was at Rutgers University on how hydroponics made the system function or how it was an integral part of it. And then three from the University of Arizona. First, this single trust tomato production system or a whole series of co colleagues of mine put together designs for growing tomatoes one meter tall, just to a single truss. 
But to be able to move those plants around, to be able to transplant and harvest effectively, we needed a transport system. And that's what you see here. These plants are at 10 per square meter, about one per square foot. And that's very dense for tomatoes, for sure. Um, it utilizes the ebb and flood irrigation system, which essentially um, with as long as the bench is still and not moving, we can irrigate it, flood it, drain it in a matter of minutes, and then return that water to the nutrient storage tank. And afterwards, the bench could be transported or before for that matter. And that concept was to get the plants out of the greenhouse into a workstation. And here you see a picture of an elevated workstation that can receive a bench, raise it, allow work to be done on it, people standing around it in more comfort than bending over. And, and then it could be transported to the next aisle and um, basically make this merry-go-round effect in the greenhouse, increasing spatialization, reducing labor, and hopefully increasing yields. Um, at that time, we were about 25 kilos per square meter. Today, we're in the 60s and 70s and 80 kilos per square meter of tomatoes. Um, this system was able to bring it up to about from 25 to 35 kilos per square meter. So there was that, that benefit of productivity, obviously, to pay for the additional costs. And ultimately, looking way into the future about the possibility we're looking down on the crop right now, which a robot could be looking down and making that harvest and not even have to uh, displace the benches. Some work that preceded this was my PhD dissertation on the movable row um, cable culture, cable supported plastic film. Basically that the rows spacing from left to right in this picture could be increased or decreased. And we could start with high density planting and have them close together and then um, space the rows out. And as the other crops reach their maturity, they are taken out and replaced. So this is a nutrient delivery system uh, recyclable in a vertical nutrient film technique, unique, not typically recommended, but still functional in these short rows. They're, they're only about 80 feet long. So 40 feet from each end to the middle of water flow, and we could get good yields and get continuous yields if we use high pressure sodium lighting. Um, here's a diagram of the cable and the plant and the tube and the roots in the picture on the right. Um, you see the white roots uh, coming through the clear plastic, to, uh, plastic film um, pouch, if you will, that's hanging on the cable system. No support in between, only at the ends with the use of um, movable rows and hydroponics to um, allow the water to get to the root system, which is another challenge as always. The South Pole Fruit Growth Chamber was work done at the University of Arizona. And here's a model of the food production room, the food growth room, and the environmental room. Um, if we now go and pretend we're standing in the environmental room and look into the food growth room, this is what you see. A glass wall between you and the crops, the crops in their proper environment, the people outside have a sitting room to um, enjoy the warmth, the, the fragrances, um, the, the moisture that's in the air near this facility as compared to the cold, dry South Pole environment. Um, this used two types of hydroponics, the NFT, a true NFT trough off to the right at two levels here, and a deep water trough, which was not movable, um, in the middle. And again, high pressure sodium lamps that are water cooled, allow those tomatoes to grow right up to the top so that they would not be damaged by the heat of the light. If we look at how this saves space, these are rows of the NFT troughs that are on a tray that can move um, from the upper, they stay there. Um, the lower ones can move right to left 
to create the walkway. And when you're not in there doing any work, you move that, that group of lower troughs to fill up that walkway. And then the light from above is shining only on green plant matter. And um, the deep water culture is in the middle for the tall crops. And you might note that the lamps are over top of the walkway on either side of the tall crops. So we have a uniform lighting distribution once the troughs are moved back into the center. And that is a recirculating hydroponic system. And it was put down in the South Pole Research Station in 2004. It's been operable ever since. We gave up working on it as advisors in 2012. Um, I was never down there to see it, but a number of my students spent uh, time there during the summer uh, periods and um, learned how to grow crops because they, they produced one salad per person every day at, out of the system with yields that were close to what we were expecting at that time of about a total biomass of 50 kilos per square meter per year. Um, all electrically lighted, so it's expensive uh, power, but uh, fully recycling hydroponic system um, um, at, at the South Pole. From there, we, we had project with uh, NASA, a number of projects, but the culmination of that is this Mars Lunar Greenhouse uh, that ended its, um, its time around 2017. Um, but Marat is beginning to pick that up again. I'm looking forward to seeing how that could be. But again, a um, recirculating hydroponic system that delivered the nutrients to the root zone of the plant. In, in this case, it should look familiar from the 1983 picture. It's that cable supported system. And why was this cable supported system of great benefit here? It's because it's lightweight. It's probably the lightest weight trough you can build and still be able to grow a plant in it. And by the way, it's collapsible. This whole device, these circular rings um, come together and all the components inside fold up, including the growing system, including the high pressure sodium lamps. And this was a design and development by Phil Sadler of Sadler and Sheen Company. And what we did was demonstrate that we can get crops growing in it and many types of crops. So here's that cable supported uh, plastic tube uh, with tomato, sweet pepper, white potato, and even strawberry. And, and the last at the University of Arizona that I'm gonna speak is about seed corn production. This was an opportunity that came to me in 2015 when I was challenged that could we grow corn in our greenhouses. And um, in February, the challenge was thrown down. In June, they came and we gave them harvested um, corn, not of the quality that they were looking for, but uh, we had a lot to learn. But we used the same concept of ebb and flood. Reason being is that each one of these plants um, um, is, is in a pot that needed to be cared for individually. Um, this is seed corn now. So there's many, many um, um, variations on the theme, if you will, that were planted in here. Uh, I'm not knowing what they were. Uh, just put the little stick in there and they know what it was. Um, but, but basically um, flooding from the bottom allowed the water to uh, siphon up or, or um, 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 go up into uh, the, to fill the pot uh, soil with moisture. And I can show you pictures of complete roots up root filling of the pot um, after a 90 day uh, production, 80 to 90 day production period. Um, here we are near harvest are doing some sampling and you see they, they open up and they show the, I mean, these are eight inch long ears of corn. Um, we were able to do this in February. Um, um, the Iowa couldn't compete with us uh, on that scale when it's frozen and cold there, but in the warm greenhouse using supplemental lighting and an ebb and flood irrigation system provided the nutrients that the plant need and the water. And it did it in an efficient way and allowed for uniform, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, allowed for reducing water 
um, by about 90, 95%. But also the concept was that we could get three or more, slightly more than three crops per year, which would then reduce the development time from 10 years down to seven years for a new variety of corn. And, and thus the, the company um, now, now known as Bayer um, had built, has built since that time, the Bayer Marana Arizona greenhouse. And I put 2019 when it started and I hope it continues for decades, but here's a picture of it. Um, um, you see a hundred million dollars plus and seven acres, three and a half on this side and three and a half on the other side of production greenhouses for seed development. A lot of expense, of course, went into the center area, which is laboratories and, and a lot of equipment and supplies and all to evaluate um, with plant breeders. So, and last, a picture inside when it was finally complete, but not with plants in it. You see the transportable benches here that are ebb and flood. You can barely see the, the inlet here and it floods the bench and it drains back on the same side and all the water goes back to storage to be recycled. But no one has to go into this area of the greenhouse while the crop is growing. The bench moves out onto a transfer device and that automatically carries it, dries it, if you will, pushes it to a specialized room where the, the phenotypic phenotyping can be done and the evaluation of the growth. Um, their focus is only on corn um, at this facility. And um, they are uh, doing a reasonably well. Um, they are hiring our students. So I'm, I'm certainly pleased about that. Okay, enough of the, uh, of the background, but I hope you got an impression of how the hydroponics can be selected properly and put into these systems designed to work in integratively and in a, in a positive way to produce the crop because controlled environment is not just maintaining the aerial environment, the temperature, the humidity, the light CO2, but the root zone environment as well. And hydroponics is the only way I know to, to um, quickly and efficiently change and modify that root zone should you have to do that. So with this in mind, I, I wanna move on to other things, but there's two items I have here. I hope that you can come back and see these. One is to read a, a very good review by Chris Curry on the most practical and common hydroponic systems that are in use in North America today. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the link in time. Uh, I only read it about a week ago, uh, but Chris promised me that, that the PDF will be available. So we'll get that to you. And the other, um, Zwart Irrigation. It's not like I'm promoting um, Zwart itself, but they have an excellent website where they show irrigation from drip, the overhead spray to movable booms to flooded floor and flooded bench. So everything I'm talking about, you can go see where you can buy it and they're able to show it in a very precise and, and um, positive looking way why you sh should purchase from them, obviously. But the other are benches, the traditional fixed benches, benches that have the individual troughs for NFT, benches that work very well with ebb and flood, meaning that they're watertight, and then benches, which now for the vertical farms, we call them towers or multi-level growing systems using electrical lighting and no sunlight. So um, these two things will give you good background that I just don't have the time to get into today. But I do want to um, go through some of the commonalities of all of these. And although Chris Curry will show you how, um, what opportunities these systems um, require to grow and produce, I'd like to go into more um, how they can be used, and I hope with my examples already, um, um, how they should be put into practice, how you might select one over the other. All hydroponic systems require these items that are bolded here. Um, you gotta hold the plant up because the roots aren't anchored in the soil anymore. And they might have very little substrate around them. You need the root zone to be contained and um, should be kept in the dark, uh, reduce the algae growth, 
uh, reduce the evaporation from there and, and the low air humidity that might be particularly here in the, in the, in the arid regions. Um, and then what we've been talking about, how you distribute the elements that the plant needs to grow dissolved in the water by means of a pump. And that's what it, that's what it comes down to, pumping water. You spray it, you drip it, you flow it, you drench or you flood. Um, there's not much else uh, that you can do. Um, all in all, dissolved oxygen is necessary in that water. You might want to consider it as a nutrient. And if not, um, it could become a detriment um, in that root zone because the roots are alive. They're respiring, needing oxygen. Um, and therefore, they have an environmental control as well. And I mentioned the aerial and the root zones. And um, um, the root zone with the water movement uh, helps with that dissolved oxygen. Um, the nutrient delivery system, uh, commonality amongst all of them. Well, it consists of water with fertilizers that are dissolved in them. And they usually start at a central location. And that might be a storage tank above ground or below grade. And that there's a reason why you might have one or the other and or no storage tank at all, and it's mixed on the go. But usually in that circumstance, it's um, um, a drain to waste system where you're not recycling. And that's something that's gonna have to change and will go away in the future for sure. Certainly we're teaching all our students about recycling nutrient systems now, as opposed to the drain to waste. And then there's a pump. It becomes a plumbing problem, a pump that will bring the water to drippers where there might be one at every plant or a dripper that might be at the head of one row and the trough runs the length of the, the width of the room or the length and all the plants inside get water from this one dripper as it flows underneath from sub-irrigation. Or there might be benches that have ebb and flood where we have an inlet that fills and floods and then drains away or expand that as far as you can and make the entire floor an ebb and flood system and have no benches at all, no transportation necessary. Put the pot down once like a poinsettia and pick it up when you, when you harvest. Um, drainage return systems. Now these are certainly gonna be necessary to collect any drain water and we require uh, excess watering 10, 15, 20% overwatering because of our high salts in our irrigation water. Uh, we collect that and uh, it comes out with, from the drippers, it collects in the, in the bag, and then there is on the other side a means to collect the drain water and direct it back to the tank. Um, also controls and monitors that I'll be discussing in a moment. Fertigation. Um, it's not just water, it's water with nutrients, and it's the timing of, and delivery of the frequency of that irrigation and the duration that's important for the crop and for the size of the pot that the, pot, the crop is in and the material substrate that the pot is filled with. Essentially, you could start with a time clock that just does every day from sunup to sunset, every uh, 15 minutes, uh, give it a two minute shot of, of irrigation. And we do that with our, with our uh, tomato systems and it works, it works very well. But it's, there's improved ways with computer monitoring that know what the light intensity is in the greenhouse and can change the frequency of watering based on the amount of solar radiation that is being measured. Measure it, hit a set point value of total amount of photons, that are received and then reset it to zero, start your watering up again and start counting. Um, along the process, you need to have makeup water because the water you pump out, not all of it comes back. Um, and that's because the plant is absorbing and that's good. That's what we're doing it for. But then if there are situations where you need to monitor since you're not always going to want to be there or can be there, low water in your system tank, um, the pH of the water, the conductivity, the electrical conductivity, I should say, the EC, um, those are monitored regularly and can tell us uh, 
about um, uh, in, uh, changes that we need to make. Um, and if the automated fertigation system, which I'm showing in a picture here, and I'll detail in the next slide. And, and also we need alarms about environmental conditions, high temperature situations, power failures, and cold temperature situations. Here's an example of a fertigation system, a, a controller, which basically has a small microprocessor here, um, which controls these peristaltic pumps, three of them, one to match each one of the nutrient stock tanks, which are there with the so-called A solution and B fertilizer solution at a one to 200 concentration. And then a tank that we need, which is of acid, because our water is very alkaline and we have to bring that 7.8 to 8.0 pH down into the sixes, um, at least. And there's our stock that is pumped into the big 150 gallon nutrient storage tank. And that water is completely uh, continually recirculated by the sensors that go back to the control controller and, and tell of the EC and the pH and whether it should add more or the low water uh, float valve, which increases the water in the tank. And then the fertigation controller responds to the reduced EC because it gets diluted and the increased pH because we're adding uh, 7.8 uh, pH water. Anyway, we create this nutrient storage tank so that when the irrigation pump or the distribution pump that I show here turns on, then it um, irrigates all the plants with the same water simultaneously um, and very uniformly. And then, it, and then it shuts down and then the, um, any water needs to be added is added and the whole process starts over again and does this 24 hours a day. This is an example of a controller there are a number of them out there now. This happens to be AutoGrow um, that we've been using. Um, the beauty of this and others is that not only does it control these pumps to maintain a set point EC and pH in our nutrient storage tank, but and, and also temperature of the tank, but it can relay this information into the cloud so we can, and maybe more importantly, my graduate students and undergraduate students can see the environment of the root zone of the plant and how that is doing well or needs to be improved. You saw this picture before. This is an example in Arizona, um, 60 to 100 milliliters is put out through each one of these drippers, one per tomato plant, somewhere between one and five times per hour maybe once per hour at this stage, when they become six, eight, 10 feet tall, then uh, we're up to five times per hour, particularly after we get into our hot summers. But you can take that exact system and put it on this aluminum trough and raise it into the air. You see the picture off to the right. It is above the ground. It, it supports the crop. It takes any of the drain water into these channels on either side directs them to the far end and recycles the water so that there's no runoff. It all goes back to being reused and put back into the system. So it's the same top drip irrigation, but now it's in somewhat of an automated way of raising the benches to be able to have a more efficient use of space and in transferring plants um, when you're, when you're um, taking the old crop out and putting the new one in. Okay, a couple of word slides um, that I'm not gonna read in detail. You can come back and see this, I hope. Um, basically, ebb and flood, um, it's a big one. Obviously, you see, I, I have a lot of, of uh, love for that because what it can do in terms of mechanizing a greenhouse, it doesn't have any connection to its irrigation input nor its irrigation drainage. The bench can be moved at any time unless you're in the middle of an irrigation process. Um, you irrigate to a shallow depth, one or two inches, um, and a frequency maybe of one to three times per day, again, depending on the age of the plant and depending on the, the time of year. But you want a quick fill and a relatively quick drain. 
I like uh, five minutes to fill the entire bench or the entire floor. Uh, serious pumping if the floor, but a bench five minutes is easy to fill. And then within 10 minutes, have it all drained back out. Ebb and flood really means having fewer um, uh, a short duration, um, uh, fewer long duration floods, not good. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, you wanna have a minimum amount of time that the water is, is in there and you wanna do it more frequently as opposed to leaving water, standing water in the bench or on the floor for an extended period of time. And that comes down to the saturation of the air. You need about 10% air volume at saturation that will uh, drain, has good porosity. It will drain out relatively quickly to so-called field capacity and then bring in fresh air and allow that dissolved into the water to increase the DO at the, in the root zone. Um, example of potted plants here on a transportable bench using ebb and flood. And there is the non-contact irrigation. There's no connection to a drip system that's on this bench. And to me, that makes a lot of sense towards labor savings and automation. And here it is in a huge greenhouse layout where you see there's no room for people to go in here. The only way to get to these plants, and hopefully you don't have to, only at filling, putting in a transplant, and then at harvest, is to remove the bench completely out of the bay. Ebb and flood allows you to do that. NFT channels in um, one of our research greenhouses, here's four rows put together. It's an aluminum trough, basically, uh, with a polyethylene white on black poly cover and holes cut in it to put the tomato transplants in here. And the nutrient storage tank is right below where the water just drains from each trough into its own tank. And there's a pump on the outside of this tank that re-pumps the water to the head end of each bench, uh, each trough. And each trough has about a one or 2% slope. Um, and the, 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 the tiny, these are pot tomatoes or mini micro tomatoes. Um, they love it. And there's the fertigation control system shown there. Here's one of Phil Sadler's designs. Um, a nutrient uh, NFT trough that was used at the South Pole. Um, this is a very short one. It's about three feet, a little less than a meter, because this device, when you take it apart, could fit in the dishwasher at the South Pole. So they could have them sterilized, cleaned, um, as long as nobody had any dishes in there at the time. Um, deep water culture floating raft, a real popular way to grow right now. Um, um, this is an insulated tank about four foot by eight foot in, in width and, and length. And the floating um, uh, polystyrene uh, board or um, rigid polyethylene boards are used uh, that are much more durable. Plants are transplanted as a seedling into holes that are regularly spaced eight uh, by eight or seven by seven inches on center and you get a very uniform crop as you see here. You see the students that are lifting it up and there's a four by four tray of beautiful white roots. Um, what we need for someone to do is figure out how we can eat these roots and then we'd have 100% uh, except for the little rock wool cube that we could uh, harvest index uh, at 100%. Um, by the way, this is the way we can grow in Southern Arizona uh, in the heat of the summer, uh, in a greenhouse that we can only maintain about 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit at the peak of the day, not all day, but at the peak. And, and in doing so, it, um, it keeps the, it, the insulation keeps the water wa uh, cooler at 75 degrees, 20, 24 Celsius. And as such, the plant does not bolt, lettuce does not bolt. We can get lettuce grown in the summer with deep water floating raft culture systems. Um, and these are happy students. I, I just love this picture. Uh, you, you never know how they're gonna come out, but there they are in front of their, uh, their crop. And I say they're happy students because they're even happier employed students right now. Um, you may know some of these, 
Some of you may actually be on in, in this discussion here. And if you are, I thank you for allowing me to use your picture, even though I didn't ask. Aeroponics, the last aeroponics. Um, here's an A-frame structure where we irrigate with a spray nozzles underneath and on the slope sides of the A-frame are where the plants are, are put in and the roots are bathed in the water um, that is pumped from a reservoir. Really the bottom of the A-frame is a big tank. And this is Dr. Tina Hayden that developed with her partner Native American Botanics because she was growing um, these crops for um, nutraceutical and pharmaceutical purposes. And what the natives, this is burdock root, the Native Americans, um, it's awful hard to, to hunt them down in the, in the wild and they're not as um, available as they used to be. But if we could grow them hydroponically and harvest the roots without killing the plant, that's what the aeroponics allowed. Again, a specialized nutrient delivery system that you could give the roots a haircut, not kill the plant, go on top and take some of the aerial biomass off and the plant would regenerate itself. Um, Tina also did studies with aeroponics of ginger. In here, where I'm gonna show you the details of, there's the ginger exposed at this point here, the leaves of the ginger and the roots are down in the bottom using aeroponics. So here's that same picture without, without Tina in the picture. There's the leaves at the top, there's the roots at the bottom that were sprayed aeroponically, and there's the beautiful ginger that is growing in this darkened area in between here. Again, using aeroponics and nutrient delivery to grow a crop in the way you want to grow it. Here's an ugly looking radish uh, grown on a rock wool cube that's about one inch tall, so you get an idea of scale here. But the idea was, um, could we grow the radish aeroponically and here we are in a framework. And yes, of course you, you can, but can you do it um, by eliminating their roots or minimizing their roots? So the framework here about one meter long and three quarters of a meter wide, lots of spray nozzles, uh, a tank underneath it that's not shown where we store the water, but on top a support frame, which what we're gonna do now is look at the roots from underneath the support frame but above the nozzles. So we're looking up inside there. And these are the roots of each radish grown out of this rock wool cube on the top, of course. Um, and we were able to, um, by cycling the water every three hours, giving it a spray, um, to keep the roots air pruned in amongst the rock wool cube, yet maintain the yield close to, not exact, but close to what the yield was when we did it on a 30 minute cycle, watering cycle frequency, or a 60 minute watering cycle. But on those cycles, we ended up with a lot of root mass down here. In fact, it would grow down into the tank below and it was no longer aeroponics. It was, it was drinking continuously. Point is, we don't need those roots. And, and therefore, I thought this had a lot of benefit that we could now with aeroponics control where we direct the, the benefits of photosynthesis to the edible product part of the plant, not the inedible part. The last series of slides are from my class and I'm not gonna go through these. I'm gonna highlight a couple of things and I really encourage you to go back and look at these. They highlight what you have to consider in all of these systems when you want to design it for your particular application. First, volume of storage. How much storage volume do I need? And uh, there's, no, there's no theory that really is there. There's some rules of thumb that I, that I list here, and it's really based on the leaf area index, meaning how many leaves, you know, are you a tall tomato plant or are you a leafy green? And you can imagine that the larger the storage volume, the more expensive it is. The smaller the storage volume is less expensive, but the less buffer you have in your system. Meaning that whenever you pump that storage volume, when 50% of it is leaving and going out to the plants, 50% remains. 
Okay. But if you have a smaller volume where you have to pump out 75 to 80% and very little remains, that means there's a lot of dilution coming back. Um, you need better control of your EC and your pH and your dissolved oxygen for that matter. Um, so it comes down to how confident are you in your control system and how, how valuable is your crop? And can you invest in a bigger nutrient storage volume? And the answer may be yes in, in many cases, although it's no going to the moon and Mars, it has to be a very small buffer. Um, and even if you're doing rooftop hydroponics, um, like Gotham Greens does the rooftop greenhouses. Um, you don't want to have deep water culture in a big heavy tanks on top of the roof. You want a lightweight NFT system for sure. The location of the storage question, below grade or above grade? Well, if you're on the rooftop, it's going to be above grade because you can't go uh, unless you're going to pump it all the way from the ground below. But that probably doesn't make sense. Many times it's good to have below grade, meaning that your, tr your troughs that you're watering and your crops that you're watering are higher than your tank so that you can pump out of your tank, but let gravity bring the water back to the storage. No additional pumping needing, needed, you know, let physics do the work for you. Big downside on that is, uh, is your tank big enough so if your pump has to shut off, and all the water drains back to your system, does your tank overflow? Been there, done that, it happens. So uh, you might wanna keep that in mind. Um, below grade is out of the way, I kind of like that. Um, and um, it's protected from light. It's also in the cool earth, if you can, and it doesn't gain the air temperature that, that having your tanks above grade do. Okay. Um, pumping capacity. The last of this is the engineering of how big of a pump do I need and why does it have to have that much horsepower motor on it to make the pressure that I need. And again, I'm not going to go through this, but you have to consider how many zones, how big are your zones that you need to water in any given time that, you know, count your drippers, two liters per minute, a um, uh, hundred drippers, 200 liters per minute, your pump better pump at least that much. And then the pressure to get there will depend on how far away it is, the pump, your pipe size, um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, um, this is, uh, I do some examples and give you about idea of volumes that you need and the weight of those um, and the pumping capacity. And later on, um, get a example of how much horsepower does that pump need and how many kilowatt hours of electricity? Here's, here's not only your capital investment for an expensive, larger horsepower pump, but the operating cost of paying the electricity to run that pump is, is uh, forever more. Um, and that's why you might think about those deep water culture, stagnant water, it's not flowing hardly at all. You might be just pumping oxygen or air into it to keep the DO up in the, in, in the water. Again, you have to weigh these costs of the system you choose. Aeroponics, you don't pump much water, but you pump at a high pressure. This equation tells me that uh, this H gets higher for aeroponics but the Q is low, uh, the flow is low, but the pressure is high in aeroponics. In uh, NFT uh, or ebb and flow, the pressure is low, but the flow is high. So it's a trade-off on the size of a, of a pump. And look at this, one horsepower essentially is three quarters of a kilowatt. Um, if you run it 10 hours a day, that's seven and a half kilowatt hours of electricity. If you're lucky enough to get 10 cents per kilowatt hour electricity, um, that's 75 cents a day to run that one horsepower pump. Figure out how big your system is, how many one horsepower pumps are you gonna need, then you know how much electric power you're going to have to uh, provide and what that cost will be. I'm at about 50 minutes here and I love when this picture comes up because I found this from one of the early Apollo missions pictures that we could use 
And I like about extraordinary steps, footsteps forward and young people who want to do this and, and older people too that want to move into hydroponics and controlled environments. Um, I think it's time. We are, it is very much time to move forward. And with that, I'll say uh, thank you. Uh, be glad to take questions and answers. And uh, this will go up online for you to see. And um, I would, um, any questions that are not answered now, you're welcome to email me and I'd be glad to, uh, to, to do one-on-one -on -one with you. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. That was wonderful. Really thank you, Gene. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is great. <laughs> I think we opened the questions, uh, Trish. I mean, I yeah. don't know if there are some. Uh, you can you either ask the question to Gene directly, but if you, if I know sometimes people like to put questions in the chat box and I'm monitoring the chat. Okay. So if a question pops up, I'll let him know. So um, if anybody wants to ask a question, go right ahead. Yeah, good, good question. Um, first, we try to grow crops like uh, vegetative crops that we don't need pollination. And that's not the answer you were looking for. Um, tomatoes, it's been figured out for quite a while, Dan. Now, as, as you know, um, a bees, uh, the bumblebees, you can buy hives uh, and the bees work um, every day, seven days a week, never take a vacation. They do very well in pollination. Um, the seed corn was a real problem. And I think the only simple answer to that is inexpensive, but talented students. Um, and there were times when I had five, eight students um, taking care of 1500 um, corn uh, plants um, that needed pollination every day between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. I mean, they were that specific about it or else the pollen would lose its viability or, um, you know, the physiologist didn't explain it all to me. Um, so whenever we can, we use the bees. When we can't, um, there are the hand pollinators, the little, the little ticklers that work very well, but that's, that's hand labor for sure. And at the university, um, um, in the name of getting students experience, we, uh, we, put, we put them to work. Um, but but that's not all. Uh, they are taught and they learn to understand when the plant is not happy. They become our eyes when we're not there and understand when systems aren't working right. So our students that leave working in our in our greenhouses are not just pollinators. They're, they are on their way to, to understanding growing in a controlled environment. How's, how's that for an advertisement? Well, um, we the project is finished. If it wasn't, I'd be glad to invite you over and uh, wait till the hottest day in July. Um, and as you know, the uh, evapotranspiration makes the humidity much, much higher amongst the plants. And they were at a roughly one corn plant per square foot. So there's a lot of biomass transpiring in there. So, so normally corn is wind pollinated. You can't use fans to help you uh, with any of the pollination. Is it just because it's in a controlled environment? Yes, it is in a controlled environment, but they're, it, they're very careful about pollen escaping. Um, we had to make sure that there was no other corn growing within 750 feet of a contained greenhouse to legally be able to do this. Um, the other reason is that there's many varieties and sometimes uh, within, um, that's not the word they use, it's escaping me right now, but, but different um, genotypes, if you will. And you have to put a bag over the male part and on the female part. And when you want to pollinate, um, cro uh, pollinating internally, then you, you do that by hand from above tassels to the lower silks. But sometimes we were taking this pollen and bringing it over to another plant 
in another bench. So uh, no way did they want um, the wind pollination. Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Jean, I have a question. Uh, I'm very, very, again, congratulations, very, very interesting uh, um, presentation. Uh, you mentioned about the roots. Uh, so uh, trying to get you know, the complete uh, cycle, you know, potentially um, selling roots. Uh, what, yeah. uh, uh, can you expand a little bit more about that? Are there applications and what traits uh, do, do, do we have to consider for marketing? <laughs> well, I, I was I was more or less um, making making a joke about that that we don't need the plant to produce inedible parts if we could consume those beautiful white roots. To me, um, um, I, I haven't eaten them. Um, we, <laughs> um, I haven't even looked at what what the nutritional value would be. If someone out there has, I'd love to to hear about it and, and know about it. I haven't heard about that. Um, I have to believe if you get hungry enough and you're on Mars, um, you, you might eat those roots. <laughs> yeah. For sure, for sure, a lot of carbohydrates. Uh, but yeah. And, and, fiber, yeah. But, uh, and they're already salted with the fertilizer. So uh, you just have to add a little pepper, mm -hmm. maybe a little uh, uh, oil and vinegar sauce or something. I don't know. Another question, Gene. Uh, uh, what's, what's your view or feeling in terms of potential commercial application uh, using vertical towers? Not vertical farming or layers, not like air farms, but uh, um, do, you see, do you see that uh, system commercialized at a very high level? Or? Well, it's becoming um, um, certainly very, very popular and, and people are installing them and, and putting them to use. I think the jury is still out about profitability of using a totally enclosed, uh, only uh, sole source electric lighting. Um, but what it can do for you is uh, you need a much smaller footprint. So you're, you are getting increased plants per square meter, um, uh, plants per cubic meter, if you will, because you're doing multiple layers. Um, so if you're in an urban agricultural situation, um, that you might want to go vertical in that case, keep it indoors completely with uh, no sunlight, um, but be able to uh, pay your operating cost uh, re remains to be seen. The, the technology is here to do that. Um, the hydroponics can readily do that. That's not a concern. Um, uh, still, uh, even the labor, uh, the, the, those that are, that are way ahead in this area of vertical farming have, have automated, have mechanized to reduce the labor needs and to, to bring the plants to a centralized workstation. That, that is to me the most practical way in all these harvest um, and, and transplant situations, not having people going out into the greenhouse, if at all possible, except for maybe maintenance. So um, um, if, if you need to, if you're limited on space, and you have a close market of, um, uh, I'll say, that can handle um, increased uh, uh, price points, then um, vertical farm towers make, make, can make a lot of sense. Um, um, but the competition will be um, um, a greenhouse using sunlight and maybe supplemental lighting that's 10 miles, even 30 miles outside of the city limit and trucking that in. Um, that's what, what you, you have to compete against. But um, think about it. There's um, thousands of farm markets around the country, and they, they have people supplying them. Um, so a small greenhouse operator um, develops a market with this farm market, and then the farm market sells locally. They put their name on it. It's branded, maybe. They know their farmer. It's consistent. Um, there, there's a lot of positives there that that uh, we have to tap into, and and distribute our um, production uh, amongst uh, areas, urban and rural, throughout the throughout North America, and and have less, I think, concentrated um, in in specific areas of the country, even if they can produce it more efficiently. I mean, that, except for transportation, um, the, the, the environment is so much uh, appropriate 
um, in, in some areas of the country for particular crops. But a greenhouse or a vertical farm can take an unacceptable area and create the environment for that crop to grow locally. And that's, that's the beauty of controlled environments. And that's the challenge that any business has. Um, going vertical should be a consideration. It may not be your final decision though. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I got one more. You know. <laughs> Go ahead. It, it, you talk about the A-frame um, and yeah, vertical, maybe a tower. Have you seen problems in certain species in terms of you know, the phototropic response? I mean, you know, obviously plants naturally will go, we're gonna try to go you know, geotropic for the roots and for you know, phototropic for the uh, up in the plants. But uh, yeah. in the, the A-frame that you have you know, some degree, some degrees on that, uh, or how you position the plants in those vertical. Have you seen some changes maybe in the, in the transition zone, the, the hypocotyl or shoot roots uh, area there that make curve those plants and then change maybe some hormonal balance and, uh, or, or it's not an issue? Well, you're, you're getting a little bit into physiology, which is um, somewhat beyond me at this point, but um, yes, on the, the A-frame that, that we've used, um, um, you, the, the hypocotyl, the stem, if you will, does turn upward towards, towards the sun. And if it's a head of lettuce, it is kind of flattened on one side a little bit more than the other. Um, and it's not unlike the vertical towers where it's coming out horizontally. Um, but if it's lettuce or if it's basil, um, you're, you're ripping up the leaves anyway, in the end, it's not like you may expect, uh, you know, a head of romaine lettuce that's grown vertically, um, you know, that's horizontally, but comes up vertically. Um, uh, you're chopping it up anyway. I, I don't see a significant uh, concern about that. And you get all the benefits of the automated watering, uh, in the, in the towers and the A-frame and the benefit of the, the space utilization. So um, the plant does respond um, to that angle, um, but it hasn't been, and no one that I know of has ever um, come up with, uh, you know, an analysis that said you can't do it because of the slope of that, uh, of that surface. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I, I'm just asking because of, no, I, I saw it, a system you know, here in Texas you know, a few years back, I mean, not much experience but different type of crops in addition to lettuce and it, it was quite significant so but uh, okay. some others some others not i mean like you say some others have been perfectly fine yeah thank you there there still is the the light intensity response um particularly on the vertical towers certainly the plants down below are getting less light than the plants at the top mm -hmm. and and um and significantly uh 40 30 40 percent less uh, on just an uh, example, um, but on the A-frame, um, it's going to be a little bit less, uh, but 10, 15 percent, 20 percent maybe, um, depending on how close your A-frames are together. And certainly uh, they should be or oriented um, the, the middle of it, north to south. So you have an east side frame and a west side frame. Mm -hmm. And you try to, you know, have a pretty good angle so that uh, um, you, you don't diminish the light. But uh, there's only so many photons that come down and uh, you can put more plants there, but they're, they're gonna have to share and therefore they get less light per plant. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, James, such a wonderful talk. Jinghua, how are Hi. you? Very good. Thank I you. I really enjoy your talk. Uh, may I ask you a question about the greenhouse environment control? Sure. What do you think about the future for like Texas or Southern US with high humidity? How could we uh, realize a year round production like in, in greenhouse? Um, um, I, I know in Arizona, you have very good temperature control. You're probably using a combination of uh, method like uh, 
uh, misting and uh, of course the evaporative cooling is much more effective in your area? Yes, yes. Very good question. And um, I love Arizona for that, the dry air. Um, when we're at 10% relative humidity, our evaporative cooling pads can reduce the temperature 30 or 35 degrees Fahrenheit from one side of the pad to inside the greenhouse. It's just phenomenal. And then we use uh, fog systems and mist systems that can uh, even improve on, on that. Um, however, um, we're, we're changing that. We are growing right now. I have a student that's going to be reporting in a few weeks about how we are raising the temperature uh, on purpose uh, with tomatoes and lettuce, and we're raising the humidity inside the greenhouse um, and um, maintaining productivity in doing so. Um, it's, it's all about, um, without getting into any kind of details at this point, um, uh, uh, the energy balance of the leaf and the total balance of the canopy of the plant. And if you um, force the plant to live at higher air temperatures, then the, um, the VPD um, will, will drop, the vapor pressure deficit, um, and it will then begin closing stomates and photosynthesis goes down. So you're going into a negative direction. In this case, if you add moisture to the air, then you can maintain a more um, a generous VPD that will keep the stomates operable and the stress on the plant is reduced. Um, and so we are artificially providing that higher humidity and in the process creating a higher temperature so mm -hmm. that it can live um, and produce um, as it would at the lower temperature. And um, so there, there is potential for, um, um, I, I don't know Texas exactly, um, but um, if it's anything like Florida in the summertime, then I, I can appreciate the, the high humidities. Um, um, and, um, mechanical means to dehumidify become just outlandishly expensive. Um, so we need to develop the crops that can tolerate these higher more typically we consider stress conditions. And, and that's what we're beginning to work with right now as, as we speak. Okay, I'm right. looking forward to your um, publication or anything uh, important. Very good. Thank you so much.